friend who puts the newsletter together. We'll have another one out here soon. But uh, uh, sure appreciate all the hard work that uh, both of those gentlemen do and your prayers that uh, keep this program going. Well, uh, today I want to have a, a, an old pastor friend of mine on, and uh, we're going to make him mad. We're going to make him mad, but uh, it's going to be a Jesus kind of mad. It's going to be scriptural. And uh, uh, Peter Micus, a dear friend of mine, he and Christy, uh, pastors, of, they were our pastors for, for many years there in the St. Louis area, uh, messengers dash of dash messiah dot org www dot messengers dash of dash messiah dot org hello peter hello tim thanks for joining us well, it's always great to talk with you well uh, because you taught what you taught you, I, a lot of people in fredericktown got mad at me because here i was we we had our hanukkah candles in the front uh, in the front uh, window and not a christmas tree and I want you to take about five or six minutes to explain that. What what is biblical? Is a Christmas tree biblical? Is what they had what they talked about in Jeremiah that that tree is that what similar to what we have today? Or, or should Christians have us Hanukkah candles? And did Jesus celebrate Hanukkah? Take about five or six minutes and explain all this for us. All right. First of all, what we need to understand quickly is Jesus' real name is Yeshua. Did celebrate Hanukkah, and if you look at John chapter uh, 12, especially, it's or 10 through 12, you will find that uh, when he's talking about the, the lights, he's talking about Hanukkah, Feast the Feast of Dedication. And whether we celebrate it in a literal uh, way as the Jews celebrate it, I don't find that necessary. I always find that it's best to celebrate the understanding and spirit of the day, but uh, not the not some kind of ritualistic way. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me try to get a couple points across here. Number one, we need to know that biblically, if you look in the Bible, you don't see birthdays. You see this conceived, that conceived, conception, conception, conception. The Jews had such a ritualistic way of handling their sexual affairs that they pretty much understood when and how of conception. So to them, the life begins at conception, not when it's born. So when we see in the Bible, the main part we have to understand is that John 10.22 is where it starts, yeah. Well, that's Feast of Dedication. Yeah, Feast of Dedication. All right, but anyway, going back to that, this is why uh, we don't see anything about the birth in Mark or John. It's uh, totally unimportant. So, and Luke was a Greek and a historian. And what he's doing, he's writing the picture as a historian mm -hmm. and putting it together. Matthew's putting it together because he wants the Hebrews to understand the prophetic picture and that's why he brings in the prophetic picture of the birth but mark and john don't even say anything about it because it's not important mm -hmm. to them the important part is the beginning of his ministry and his ministry and his deity mm -hmm. so when we see in luke and in matthew especially in luke where we have the picture of zachariah zachariah serving the course of Abijah. Now, that is important because serving that course, we can go back to Chronicles and we can find the course of Abijah. And then we know that the three pilgrim feasts of the Jews, that all the priests serve through the pilgrim feast completely. So if he's serving the course of Abijah, he's then going to stay through the courses and through the pilgrim festival. So then the Jewish law of that time, and that's why the Bible also brings up Zechariah being so uh, uh, proper as far as keeping the law to the letter of the law. So the letter of the law in those days was after his service as a, in the course of Abijah would be to stay on. Then when that was completed and stay the other courses of the pilgrim festival, then he would go home. 
than the first Sabbath evening when he would go home. The law required him then, around after dinner time, to have relationships with Elizabeth. So we understand again what the Bible has given us as a conception, not a birth, of John. Then we see that the Bible is speaking of the conception of Yeshua when six months later, when we call her Mary, but her real name is Miriam, came to Elizabeth's house and the Holy Spirit came over her, we see the conception of Yeshua. And then we can count approximately 280 days and we can know the birth. Well, that's going to be somewhere in, in mid-September without going into specific days. Then, so if we back it up, conception from the time of Zechariah to this time of the conception of Yeshua, we can see that Yeshua's conception is going to be during Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's not the birth, it's the conception. Okay. The birth is going to be during Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets in, um, in three, around 3 B.C. Okay. So this is what the Bible gives us. Okay. Now, as far as the tree is concerned, the tree, if you see in, in Jeremiah and other places, it was a, it's a pagan item of, of evergreen, of fertility, and all these kind of things, and decorated with the gold and silver balls is actually meaning the sun and the moon, okay? The little balls uh, represented the sun and the moon, which they worshipped. Well, what, what does Christmas mean, Christ's Mass? Is that what it means, Christ's Mass? When we well, say that, that's given to us by the Catholic Church who created the Mass for Christ. And is the mass scriptural? No. Because that's the the unbloody sacrifice of the mass. In other words, uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 11, and 12, he died once for all. Right. So we don't need to repeat the, uh, the, 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 the crucifixion. No, and it's just like me being born and raised Greek in the Orthodox Church. You know, it, around the Greek Easter, they all, you know, say, Christos Anesti, Christ is risen. And, when, of course, when I got into it with the priest, you know, and you're, you're talking about this, I asked them one simple question. Why is it one day out of the year Christ is risen, the rest of the year you have him crucified on a cross? Mm. You know, and then you go around blaming the Jews for killing killing Jesus, yeah. and then one day out of the year you let him come out of the grave and be your God and your Savior. What That's the time you wear him as a crucifix. What, what did he say to that? Well, well, they did a Greek exorcism on me. <laughs> I, I, I heard of one uh, Catholic priest who, who came to the Lord when uh, a lady uh, came up to him after he had said uh, a Mass for her husband who had just passed away. She said, how many Masses will it take for my husband to get out of purgatory and into heaven? And uh, he, couldn't, uh, he couldn't respond. He couldn't come up with an answer. Well, you know the way I respond to that one for people? Hmm. If it takes 600-plus uh, cardinals... To pray for the Pope, what chance do you have? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, oh man, that's just—it's uh, just amazing to me. Uh, so, what do you do? How do you handle it when people say to you, "Merry Christmas"? I say "Merry Christmas." Do you? And in the past, it would—you you, know—because I learned this almost 40 years ago. That, you know, the biblical truth. No, under the main key is you've got to understand the culture. And you got to understand the history that the Bible was written in. And when I learned that and was able to put it together and see the truth, it bothered me a lot for a long time about Christmas. Mm -hmm. But this particular year, with Trump becoming the president and the, all the anti-Christian stuff for the last eight years, uh, I've actually come to the point now where I don't mind saying Merry Christmas to people <laughs> just because, you know, if we're fed up with all the anti, anti-Christian anti stuff that we've been shoved at and, and persecuted with. Mm -hmm. So I just say Merry Christmas back, and if there's an opportunity to tell people the truth, I do. If they want to listen, fine. If not, I, I don't bug people about it. When you, uh, you know, John Hagee doesn't believe that Jews uh, need to be witnessed to. And that's really bugged me because the Bible says in John Romans 1.14, the gospel goes to the Jew first. 
and also to the, the Gentile. What would you say to a John Hagee? What I said to John Hagee. What, what, would you, oh, what did you say to him? <laughs> I told John Hagee he was wrong. <laughs> Biblically, he's totally incorrect. You might be trying to make friends and uh, everything else with the Jews, but they need the gospel shared with them. They don't need a Catholicized, Orthodox, or pagan Jesus shoved at them. They need to understand the fulfillment. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. The just, scriptures. And, you know, is he looking at that verse where it says all Israel will be saved? What's he looking at? Where is he getting that? That's where he gets it. Okay. I mean, I was I was at a conference uh, three times with him, and uh, it, it was uh, rather interesting. Well, what is what is that verse referring to then? All right, what it's referring to is, is rather kind of simple. When you look at the the picture, we have to understand that the Hebrews, the Jews, which traditionally today are a mix of Jews, Benjamites, and a mixture of some of the tribes when they were dispersed many, you know, a couple thousand years ago. Uh That makes up your modern uh, Jewish people. Right. Right. Now, you also have to understand the dispersion of the, the ten tribes throughout the, uh, the world. And when Paul was sent out to be a, a teacher to the Israelites, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not to Judah, but to Israel, right. then what the Scripture is talking about is telling the Jewish people that, and those who became believers in Yeshua as the Messiah, don't become arrogant about your relationship with the Lord, because the Lord is the Lord of all. Mm. So, therefore, the word went out from Judea, went with Paul, went out with some of the other disciples, went out through the kingdom, went to different parts of the world, including Iraq and other places. And the, the day would come when all those who emanated from the house of Israel and that the house of Israel, wherever it's scattered all over the world, would also then preach to those people who are not part of the house of Israel. And then when that is all finished, then the full house Mm. that now is the house of Israel will be saved. Okay. I'm not talking yeah. about every Jew or okay. anybody else. All saved. right. Peter, we need to run your website, though, is www.messengers, M-E-S-S-E-N-G-E-R-S, dash of dash Messiah dot org. That's correct. Thank you so much, brother. God bless you and Christy. You too. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye-bye. Peter Micus, uh, pastor of Messengers of Messiah, years ago. Dear, dear friend, hope that was a help to you. We well, want to take the last 10 minutes of the program today talk with, talking with a friend of mine by the name of Jason David, J.D. We refer to him as Martins, uh, just J.D. Uh, for the last 12 years, uh, Craig, Craig Seth has graciously allowed me to rent a room at his house. And for the last year, uh, Jason's been around there, J.D., and uh, he's got a real heart for children. And uh, I imagine here you are a parent, and you don't have money to fix your children's teeth. they got cavities. And uh, what do you do? How do you handle something like that? Let's listen to, uh, to J.D. for a few minutes. J.D., are you there? I am, uh, Mr. Tim. I am. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes. Can hear you fine. Can All right. Well, cold. thank you so well, thank you so much. Uh, basically, uh, what you do is you just put it in a lot of prayer, and um, uh, then you just kind of ask the Lord to lead you. That's what you do. And uh, thanks for calling me, J.D. I like to say, uh, forget the Jack Daniels. I, I, I like Margaritas better anyway. But anyway, I say Jesus delivered, J.D. And uh, what you do, you put it in a lot of prayer, and then the Lord will lead you. And so we got a chance to start a foundation. And, um, you know, I'm a great granddaddy. And uh, not only have I been blessed with uh, children, but uh, grandchildren, and now my grandchildren have blessed me with great-grandchildren, so uh, hallelujah. And uh, so I started this uh, foundation for children because 
we know that a lot of parents do not know that they don't know about a lot of things that are going on. And you said it's, uh, it's teeth, it's dental disease, it's the number one disease in the world, and that includes the United States. Wow. So, uh, and a lot of parents don't know that, and they think, well, oh, well, big deal. You know, that's a cavity. Well, it is a big deal, and, and the reason is is because according to the United States Surgeons General, it's a silent epidemic, and according to the Mayo Clinic and research, it indicates that dental disease uh, outdistances the second biggest disease for children five times. And it helps and it contributes to heart disease, osteoporosis, respiratory disease, premature birth, the productivity of the children because they miss school, the productivity of the parents because they have to take off work to take the children to the dentist when something like that happens. And it's an infection in the mouth. It's, a, you know, it's not just a cavity. This infection is just, again, pervading the entire body. So uh, a lot of parents don't know that, and on usacdf.info, that's USA Children's Dental Foundation, but just cdf.info, we have a, a two-minute, about a two-minute and 17-second video that tells you a little bit more about it, also uh, about a little contest that our sponsors are helping us provide uh, parents. So that's how we, uh, that's how we get into it. Now, is this for anybody who's uh, uh, you know, financially challenged, uh, who has children with bad teeth? Well, it's for all children. We're not really making any kind of differentiation between whether or not they're uh, financially challenged or not. It's for all children. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of parents are not necessarily financially challenged, but they may or may not, or they may be budgeting tightly or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, if their children need to uh, see... Uh, a dentist, well, then uh, we're bringing in some of the top dentists around the country. Now, ultimately, uh, this thing will probably go worldwide because, again, dental disease is the number one disease in the world. Mm -hmm. but, th but this is the USA, uh, cdf.info, and, and the reason for that is is because, and I'm glad you asked that question, we're also going to do free dental clinics. You see, that's the, that's the deal. Mm -hmm. If a child needs to see a dentist, it's, uh, we'll be providing some free dental clinics, and these are top dentists. These are dentists that are pediatric dentists. You know, any dentist can see a child. If they're licensed, they can see a child whether they're a pediatric dentist or not. However, pediatric dentists, which are the ones that, that we bring in as members to see the children, uh, that's, that's the, uh, what we'll be doing, they have an additional two to three years study on specifically how to care for children. So that's all so part of our primary mission. Mm, okay, all right. And uh, so that, that, that's your primary mission, informing parents about dental disease? Well, informing the children about uh, dental disease, uh, we'll be doing, we have a blog up, we're doing uh, videos, and we'll be, and then again, exponentially, because of the re research is going on, uh, we are collaborating with some top research institutions. I have spoken with uh, uh, the, the, the Mayo Clinic uh, because we'll be collaborating on, on uh, providing them uh, the raw data from the for free clinics. Of course, everything is confidential, just basic raw data, uh, so that they can uh, initiate research on dental disease because our mission is to eliminate dental disease for children as the number one disease mm -hmm. in the in the country but in addition to that uh, bringing in a dentist and betting them uh, to just make sure that they are the best in their field and in addition to that providing uh, free dental clinics for children uh, underserved or not there's about 75 to 80 million children in the United States alone and again, it impacts their productivity, their work at school, their social uh, interaction with other children, et cetera. But 20 million of them approximately are underserved. Uh, so we're so 20 million. Can you imagine mm -hmm. which one of those, which one of those children, whether it's in the 20 million, 75 million, which one of those are going to be the next uh, Edison, yeah. the next Einstein, the yeah. next next Picasso? And so, and in addition to that, part of our primary clinic will, again, 
be coordinating with top research firms uh, so that the research can be done to eliminate dental disease uh, ultimately completely. Well, that could be why Picasso had such weird paintings because he had bad, dead, bad teeth. Uh, did he? You know? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I was just asking. All right, now listen, you've got a contest coming up that rewards parents with uh, your sponsor's support. Tell us about that. Well, uh, again, thank you for asking about that. That is very key. If uh, anybody that wants to learn certainly more about the foundation, but right now on our uh, primary page, which is at usacdf.info, I-N-F-O, it talks about the contest, and we are, our sponsors are basically, so that way the foundation doesn't have to put any resource toward it, our sponsors are providing support to do a free family vacation. So there's going to be a contest where people can get involved, and uh, they can simply, uh, you know, tell their friends about it. They can put it on their Facebook page, or they can tweet it out or whatever. But they have to enter the contest first. So they would go to that usacdf.info, uh, enter, and then they get an immediate email. And in that email is a special link that they can either click or they can cut and paste into a browser, and that will officially take them into the contest. And then in the contest, uh, they'll get an email that, you know, a very short, brief email that gives them some specifics. But in addition to that, they're given a personal link that they can give to their friends. They can send it out in an email, put it in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. And then every time one of the people that they tell about the contest uh, uses that link, well, then that participant gets a 100 additional points toward the leadership. So the, the ones that have the most points, they have a chance to win that free vacation, which is four days and three nights at either Disneyland or Universal Studios or, or perhaps Las Vegas, Nevada. But in addition to that, we're also going to have random drawings, and the random drawings uh, will be for a host of prizes, including uh, Amazon Prime, a full-year subscription to that, uh, a full year. I think we're getting okay. seven... Uh, annual subscription to Netflix, a yeah. full year of that. So, and then again, there are random uh, drawings. All, right. all, all part of that's together. JD, we got to say goodbye. But once again, the uh, website, uh, usacdf.info, usacdf.info, and uh, we hope a lot of you will get involved in uh, in helping out. Thank you so much, JD. God bless you, brother. Yeah, it's a free membership for parents, so right. you should check it out. And God thank you. Thank God you, God bless you, brother. Uh -huh. Bye bye. All right, and thank you so much for today. Wait till you hear next week's program. Pray for Mike and I as we head to Houston. Uh, we're still looking forward to that trip to Venezuela next month, so just pray that the Lord will open that door and we'll be able to get some good gospel tracks out there. Live for the Lord, bring home all A's, and remember 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God bless you. Bye-bye.